days, it feels like everywhere I go, restaurants, grocery stores, even on planes, I'm one of the only people out there who's still masking indoors. Everyone else has kind of moved on from COVID and the pandemic. And I get it. We've got vaccines and boosters. We've got treatments like Paxlovid. These are strong protections against hospitalization and death, though I should add, not against long COVID per se. Here's my question, though. What if those protections suddenly disappeared? It's not that far-fetched. Already, we've seen monoclonal antibody treatments stop working against the Omicron variant. In fact, the FDA revoked emergency use authorization for that treatment a year ago. And as Dr. Eric Topol notes, we don't have any new drugs to replace them, nor do we have any drugs to replace Paxlovid in the event a future variant proves resistant to that. And don't even get me started on what we'll do if a future variant is resistant to our existing vaccines. Remember, this virus is constantly, constantly mutating. Each mutation carries with it the possibility that a new strain will outdo, outlast, out-evade our current interventions. The latest variant that's spreading in the U.S. is called XBB 1.5. The World Health Organization calls it the most transmissible variant yet. It's a fusion of two previous Omicron strains that's quickly dominating the U.S. It's gone from about 2 percent of cases at the start of last month to 27 percent last week. The fastest spread right now is in the Northeast, where the variant accounts for 70 percent of new cases. And experts say it's only a matter of time before it spreads across the rest of the country. Now, the good news is that, at least so far, there's no indication that this latest variant causes more severe illness than previous Omicron variants. But could it be more immune evasive? Probably yes, says White House COVID response coordinator Dr. Ashish Jha, more than other Omicron variants. That has the potential to be a big problem. And while this new variant was first detected in New York, mutations come from all over the world and have the potential to span the globe fast. Consider China, with the zero COVID crackdown now lifted there, in a country with limited natural immunity and low vaccination rates, China is basically where the rest of the world was in March 2020, with cases surging among a population of 1.4 billion people. Experts say all of this provides fertile ground for the virus to change yet again. Now, you might be saying, but surely, Mehdi, given all we've learned since the start of the pandemic, the U.S. government is preparing for such scenarios. I hate to break it to you, but it doesn't look like that's the case. Here's White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre speaking just last week. Some of you were here for Jen's first briefing. There were 14 of you masked up. Uh, and look where we are uh, two years later. We are in a different place. We know the tools that work. We know uh, uh, what we need to do. And so we need to make sure that uh, we continue to communicate with the, commu the American people on getting that vaccine. Kind of sounds a lot like the same game plan. However, sources tell Politico the Biden administration is looking to end the country's COVID public health emergency as soon as this spring. The administration is expected to extend the emergency declaration for another 90 days on Wednesday. An administration official tells NBC News, quote, any suggestion that a specific end date has been established is untrue. However, quote, discussions about ending the designation are underway. This in a country with an abysmally low booster rate. And while the White House continues to encourage boosters, just 15 percent of Americans have gotten the updated bivalent booster, the Omicron booster, which offers the most up-to-date protection. Ending the emergency declaration could end Medicare and Medicaid coverage on this issue for millions of Americans. It also means ending funding to develop newer vaccines and newer drugs, funding that's already dropped significantly thanks to Republicans in Congress. As Eric Topol notes, currently there's no coordinated, high-priority, accelerated or even funded efforts, either in the United States or globally, to develop the next generation vaccines. Look, I know this is probably not what you want to hear, and I'm not purposefully trying to be alarmist. But in the face of a pandemic that, say it for the people in the back, is not over, Complacency is almost as bad as alarmism, especially when around 400 Americans are still dying from COVID every day, something no one ever seems to want to talk about. Look, we know what works. Masking, distancing, testing, and especially getting vaccinated and getting boosted, even though the Biden administration and the CDC long ago gave up on pushing masking, sadly. And four new free tests from the government won't do much either. Still, without the money to continue developing new treatments and new vaccines and without health coverage for millions of Americans, because America is the only wealthy nation without universal health care, the U.S. is setting itself up for more COVID failure. 
So let's talk to a Biden administration official about what can be done. Here with me now is Admiral Rachel Levine, Assistant Secretary for Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Levine is also raising awareness about the Giving Equals Living campaign during this National Blood Donor Month. Uh, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Admiral, we'll get to Giving Equals Living in a moment. But first, I do want to talk about COVID. Uh, there's talk of winding down the emergency declaration, the push uh, to get people the updated booster, which is especially important for senior citizens, isn't really visible. And while the administration did resume free at-home tests, it's just a one-off four per household. It just seems like there's barely any proper emphasis on addressing the pandemic in this current moment, start of 2023, much less should a more severe immune evasive variant emerge. How are you going to make sure we aren't caught flat-footed? Well, so the administration continues to remain very focused on the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and especially with the, the, this very contagious variant, uh, the XBB 1.5, that, that we are now seeing. So as you said, we have um, uh, renewed the, the free testing kits that people can order for their homes. And actually, just today, uh, Secretary Becerra, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, did renew the public health emergency. And the Secretary has has been out and all of us have been speaking about our safe and effective vaccines. And so what we've been emphasizing is that it's very important for people to get the bivalent update of their COVID vac vaccine this fall, especially for the most vulnerable. And that includes people over 65 and those with comorbid conditions. So you have been pushing vaccines, yes, but public health experts, scientists, doctors are all saying that given current COVID rates, given the surges, especially of XBB 1.5 surging in the Northeast, the advice should also be for people to mask again in indoor crowded spaces. But your administration never seems to say anything about masking anymore. In fact, when Joe Biden claimed the pandemic was over in September in Michigan, he pointed to people not wearing masks as evidence of that. I wonder, did Republicans just beat Democrats into submission on the issue of masking? Well, uh, the CDC continues to have recommendations uh, for counties and communities, depending upon uh, the hospitalization rate and other data in those counties throughout the United States. And so you can go to the CDC website and get information about your county, your area, uh, and how the rate of hospitalizations for COVID-19 and a recommendation um, with green that masking is, uh, is uh, um, up to, up to the individual person, yellow that might more cons uh, consider masking, or red where we do recommend masking in indoor areas. But of course, those CDC guidelines have been heavily criticized. They changed last February. Under the old guidelines, I believe something like 90% of counties would be calling for masking right now. Under the current guidelines, it's only 20%. I mean, since they relaxed the guidelines last February, almost a year ago, over 100,000 Americans have died from COVID. We're still getting 400 deaths a day. Is that a number the administration is comfortable with? Well, I, so I, again, I want to recommend that we the masking recommendations are available through the CDC website. Testing uh, can, can be ordered through your home. Um, we are really strongly recommending that uh, that people get the, the um, bivalent update, um, which is effective against the current uh, strains that we are seeing. And then we have therapeutics with the medication Paxlovid uh, for, for people who do contract COVID-19 uh, on, on the recommendation of their doctor. So uh, we are remaining very focused on the, on the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll continue to watch, you had mentioned, for any other potential variants that might, that might occur. The, the current variant, the, as you mentioned, the XBB15, um, is uh, very, very contagious, although there's no evidence that it is more virulent or causes more severe disease. But people do need to make sure that they take precautions and especially get their vaccinations. But I do want to pivot, as you said, um, to the Giving Equals Living campaign for people to donate blood, because that's critically important um, to maintain the health of our nation and our communities to have yes. a steady, consistent supply of blood and plasma. So tell us about the campaign. How is it different to previous campaigns in National Blood Donor Months? 
Well, so it's really critical. We, we've noted a year ago that there was a significant shortage of blood in many areas throughout the country. Of course, an a ongoing supply of blood and plasma is needed to treat many different conditions, for example, surgery, um, serious injuries, um, cancer, um, and many other reasons. And so um, as the blood safety officer for the United States, we launched the Giving Equals Living in campaign to increase awareness about this important public health issue. And I know you have to run, Admiral, just switching gears a bit. One last question for you. You're the highest ranking transgender person in the Biden administration. And we've seen a sharp rise in anti-trans attacks in the last couple of years, especially online. Unfortunately, you've also been targeted. A conservative satire site, so-called, was suspended from Twitter after an attack on you. Elon Musk restored that account after he took over the site. Some say he bought Twitter uh, because of that incident. We've seen a proliferation of anti-trans rhetoric on Twitter since. Uh, Elon Musk hides behind his free speech excuse. But of course, this is a life and death issue for many trans Americans. What do you make of the situation on social media when it comes to anti trans hate, especially on Elon Musk's Twitter? Well, uh, I'm not going to focus on Elon Musk, but it is the anti-trans rhetoric that we see on a number of different social media platforms is very concerning in terms of how it impacts transgender individuals throughout the country, particularly vulnerable transgender youth. Um, and so we want to uh, affirm those youth. We want to empower them. And so that's why we're concerned about these politically motivated laws that, and actions that are being taken from many states around the country. Um, and so we're going to do everything we can to support the LGBTQI plus community, particularly vulnerable transgender and gender diverse youth.